right, this is uh, Encounters with the Narwhal, still part two, by Armando Torres. This part is called Return to the Essence. After practicing a while, Carlos's teachings began to leave an imprint in me. What was mistrust at the beginning soon became an astonished verification of states of awareness beyond my mental parameters. Suddenly I possessed an urgent need to understand, although not with my reason, but with the totality of my body. I came to a point where the foundations of my everyday existence finally crumbled and it became evident to me that the perception of sorcerers contained universes of experiences which, until then, I hadn't had the slightest awareness of. During this whole process, I went through an intense identity crisis. Behaving as a daring and unprejudiced investigator at one moment, while the next moment turning into the epitome of mental resistance. I realized that these emotional fluctuations had to do with Carlos's conversations. After listening to him, weeks passed in feverish activity, attempting, dreaming, and practicing all the techniques I had heard or read about. But, little by little, my initi initial enthusiasm cooled down and I would return to the uncomfortable feeling of not understanding anything. Faced with the chaos of new situations, new sensations, which began to saturate me, I discovered that I had only had one defense, reason. More than ever, I tried to convince myself that ultimately, only the things which can be fully explained can be true. In spite of everything that Carlos had said and had noted about how deceptive reason can be, I would only be willing to tolerate this point if I myself witnessed some prodigious act that truly challenged natural law. That morning, we had an appointment in a restaurant in front of the hotel where he had stayed. We practically, we were practically alone in the room, apart from a shoe shiner who nodded in a corner, and the waiter who looked at us with an air of boredom. Judging that this was an appropriate moment, I asked, "Can you prove your teachings to me with some act of power?" He looked at me with astonishment, as if he had expected anything but this, and took some seconds to answer me. Unfortunately, he had said, I cannot prove anything to your mind. It's too far gone. To validate the Nogwal, you need free energy, and for that, the only source I know of is impeccability. In the world of energy, everything has its price, so it depends on you. I cannot silence your mind but you can, and thus verify what I'm telling you for yourself. I asked him what I could do with the doubts which inevitably arose in my mind. He answered, Uncertainty is the natural state of victims. On the other hand, trust and audacity are the characteristics of predators. You decide. The main thing is that you realize that there is no such thing as the teachings of Castaneda. I just tried to direct and to act from my silence, a course of action which I recommend for you because it does away with madness. I'm not a powerful Nogwal like Don Juan, nor am I your benefactor, but I've been a witness to acts that would leave you speechless with surprise, and I don't mind at all telling you about it. It's just those stories won't tell you anything unless you lower your guard and allow them to penetrate you. If you want to verify the tales of power, you have to open up to experience. Don't shield yourself behind your interpretations, because in spite of all your studies as modern, ordinary men, we know very little about the world. You, like any other sorcery apprentice, have an enormous training field. For example, your emotional ups and downs, your energy drainages, Plug them, and you will see how things change. Those eight hours you spend every night like a vegetable without realizing anything? Explore them. Take control and dare to be a witness. If you eludicate the secrets of your dreams, in the end you will see what I see, and there won't be any more doubts in your mind. We remained silent for a moment while our plates were served. Carlos interrupted the silence. Remember, doubts are just mental noise. 
nothing very deep. I replied that according to what little I had learned in my passage through life, doubt is the base of all true knowledge. But he had a different theory. He argued, So much time is spent accumulating stuff that it becomes very difficult to accept anything new. We are willing to waste years of our life filling out forms or discussing with friends, but if someone tells us the world is unique and full of magic, we feel distrust and we run to take refuge in our catalog of preconceived ideas. On the other hand, a predator fights all his life to perfect his hunting techniques, always keeps his sense of opportunity alert, and is never confused by the appearance of things. He is cautious and patient. He knows that his prey may jump out from any bush and that the smallest hesitation can be the difference between continuing to live or perishing. He carries no doubts. A warrior is a hunter, not a cynical opportunist. Either he fully accepts the challenge of knowledge with all that it involves or His own achievements will regress him to a more awful condition than that of an ordinary man. I felt his words contained a veil of reproach. I tried to justify myself by, but he interrupted me. It is obvious that you have been practicing. In those circumstances, your mind is disturbed, but the pain of your worrying will disappear as soon as you recognize that what you worry about is an implanted doubt. Like all of us, You have been trained to pass all the information you receive through the filter of reason. You remind me of a dog that lived in a senior citizen's home. When somebody, out of pity, threw him some crumb, he got so excited he couldn't enjoy it. You are just like that. You are so grateful to your science that you think you owe it something, that you cannot be unfaithful to it. You don't dare to dream. You cannot enjoy the magical side of the world. You have given yourself a much too deceptive parameter for your verifications. Reason. What I propose is that you substitute that approach with another, more reliable and, above all, a much wider one. Sanity. I have already explained to you that sorcerers claim there is a radical difference between the two concepts. To understand it better, think, for example, about the history of the world. Most of us made it by very sane people who nevertheless dared to challenge commonly held beliefs. They were opposed to what seemed reasonable at that time. If you travel beyond our world, you will see that it is the same there. The universe is not reasonable, but it can be faced with energy and sanity. When you learn how to use it, then you will understand it in a basic way, without words. Who needs words when one is a witness? I agree with you in that. From an everyday point of view, concepts of sorcery are completely senseless. But there is a deep dimension to our awareness. Where the complaints of the mind don't penetrate, and a warrior won't rest until he finds it. Once there, he discovers that his own reason, when it is exercised with inflexible rigor and its entirety, will automatically lead to sorcery. Because the essence of reason is sobriety indifference, and non-pity. Once he is the owner of his reason, and no longer manipulated by it, a sorcerer can attempt to feat the feat of speech, putting into words the unfathomable enigma of existence. That is such a difficult art that you can only approach it by means of a great energy surplus. To be a warrior is an endless fight to be impeccable. The trick of sorcerers is that they know that the energy we invest in enslaving ourselves is the same energy that can be invested in liberating us. We just have to rechannel it, and the tales of power will begin to materialize in front of our eyes. Therefore, don't fight against your uncertainty. Go with it. Use it as a stimulus for verification and put it to the service of your energy needs. Verify everything. Don't let a tale of power remain in the domain of myth. Commit yourself intimately to knowledge, but commit as a warrior, not as a slave of reason. He pointed out an Indian girl who was passing down the street with a boy of nine months or so tied to her back. The 
The face of the child radiated in an insatiable curiosity, spilling a bubbling out of its back, round eyes, which were like small obsidian mirrors, eagerly looking at everything. Carlos continued, The warrior's commitment with the spirit consists of a return to our original nature. It is a pact we all seal by the simple fact of having been born. Man is born with the impulse to witness everything, but it is brutally mutilated during the first years, and so we must rediscover it. You have to clean your concern of all prejudice and return to that boy's pure curiosity. A warrior is forced to verify all knowledge that arrives at his door, to experience it in full, no matter where it comes from, and then he has to have the necessary discerning ability to select and keep what is useful. Should I also apply that discerning ability to the path you preach? I asked. He seemed bothered by my question, and I replied it in a firm tone. I have already told you that there is no Costanadian way, just as there is no Buddha's way, nor one of Jesus Christ. Haven't you understood yet that teachers are not necessary? I'm not selling you merchandise. I don't care if you agree with me. I'm only pointing out the address to you. Out of a sheer and personal affection, go and verify it. If that is what you want, and if not, keep your doubts. When we said goodbye, Carlos told me, you should not pay too much attention to your worries. They are symptomatic. Something in your interior is giving in, and it is normal for your human form to defend itself. Very soon, your dealings with the Nagual will make you shake your boots, and you will need your sanity like never before. Maybe you will regret even ever having asked me for a sign.